happened in the other uh, purchase attempts. So the policy solutions, um, uh, just briefly, there have been three ways that, that um, policymakers have addressed the problem of internet cigarette sales. In the first generation, state individual states um, went forward and they sued uh, uh, the vendors. Um, the 34 states have a law, so they can sue a vendor uh, such as smokes.com or dirtcheapstick.com and say, you've sold to minors or you failed to collect taxes and so forth, and we're going to uh, attempt to prosecute you under their law. That, that failed, um, mainly because of this problem that they didn't have jurisdiction because it was a interstate transactions across state lines, so in most cases those suits, um, there were many challenges in those particular suits. In a second generation, they said, well, let's not focus on the vendor, let's focus on the buyer. And here they focused on going after the smokers, and then in the far right side is a USA Today article, and the gentleman was given a $2,000 tax bill um, for all the cigarettes he bought because the difference between um, the instead of paying, say, $70 a carton in many places with a higher tax jurisdiction, and you spend uh, $20 a carton to buy them online, you, most of that difference is due to the tax, uh, the taxes. And so he was. Um, you can, you're liable for that. States really went after the smokers one at a time, and this really was extremely inefficient um, and, and has not worked very well. There's a third generation approach that I've been, um, that I um, have developed, hasn't fully been tested, but I'll show one, one example of it, but it's called the quarantine of unhealthy internet trade. And the whole idea here is that with the internet, which is designed to really defy any type of regulation, it's trans, trans geographical, et cetera, the internet cigarette vendor is in the very center of the diagram. And the idea is to try and, um, uh, and, and again, I should stress, stress that this is not just every vendor that you're trying to shut down e-commerce. I'm not, I'm not promoting that. This is in particular for people who have repeatedly violated, um, um, violated regulations or um, when they're selling sort of um, dangerous and restricted goods. Uh, so it's only a certain type of rogue vendor. So shutting it off the supply from the manufacturer, um, uh, holding payment processing through, say, Visa or MasterCard, um, shutting down uh, their ISP, or their, their web hosting, also their ability to ship the product through a shipper like UPS. Um, these are, if you can sort of isolate the vendor or quarantine them, um, this has potential. We've done some uh, work where we, uh, if people are interested in learning a little more about the uh, some of the other policy justifications for this, there's a a knowledge assets website that we did for policymakers. And I've done a, a we did a briefing a few years back, a uh, congressional briefing about issues related to internet cigarette sales and talked about a number of these particular issues. So the, the, the concluding uh, point that I want to make is just some preliminary evidence about this quarantine framework where there was a landmark agreement in 2005 where the credit companies and PayPal agreed with the attorneys general and Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, that they would know they would cease payment processing for internet cigarette vendors. Um, and this was led by Elliot Spitzer, um, who has a lot of experience with internet issues. Uh, shipping ban. Um, in October of 2005, the UPS and DHL, FedEx, all agreed that they will not ship cigarettes from an internet cigarette vendor. So again, these are two of the parts of the quarantine framework that we talked about that we had developed years earlier. And this is a, a study where we've tracked the number of um, unique visitors to the websites. And if those of you who track unique visitor counts, almost always they're going up because of the rising internet population. Um, but this is the, the traffic that, um, that, that occurs in the very first point, uh, so starting from 2004. And in 2005 is where the first line is the credit card ban leads to an immediate drop in traffic. And then there was even a, a further drop after the shipping ban went in effect. So we saw, even though uh, there's a lot of talk that you can't do anything about the internet, you need to just allow all these types of uh, transactions occur, and, and it's kind of hopeless, um, there is some evidence here that um, some types of um, policies may uh, be able to have an impact upon that.